SPIE presents the Advancing the Laser series, honoring 50 years of laser achievements. I'm, I'm Peter Moulton. I'm currently the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of QPeak Incorporated. It's a small uh, R&D organization doing laser research and development in Bedford, Massachusetts. We're part of a larger company, Physical Sciences Incorporated, based in Andover with sites all over the country. And our main business is the development of advanced solid-state lasers, nonlinear optical systems, and development of uh, products. So, um, it's an organization I started as part of uh, the research division of Schwartz Electro-Optics in 1985, so this is our 25th year of operation. Um, and uh, been very exciting taking technology from 1985 through 2010 and seeing where it's developed. Um, before that, I was at MIT Lincoln Laboratory uh, from my days as a graduate student at MIT, uh, starting about 1970 till I left to start start the company in, in about 1985. Uh, during the period at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, I worked on my thesis, which was an attempt to try to make a tunable solid state laser in a semiconductor. And then uh, after that, I uh, worked for about 10 years developing other types of tunable solid state lasers. Um, my thesis didn't work, but subsequently I started working on some other materials, some transition metal doped crystals, nickel and cobalt in the, in the 1.8 to 2 micron region. Um, they all uh, succeeded reasonably well, but they needed cryogenic temperatures for cooling, and they had other drawbacks. One of the things that I looked at then was to try to see if there were some other materials that could work uh, more effectively. And doing, going back to sort of fundamental physics, I looked at the you know, material or the, the dopant ion titanium and discovered that it, it worked very nicely in the, the crystal host sapphire. Um, so it was an intriguing uh, material because the first laser was in fact ruby, which is chromium doped sapphire, AL203, and the titanium uh, dopant had totally different properties from ruby. Instead of being a narrow line, it was a very broad line. In fact, it's about the broadest gain line of any laser material that's, that's known, any, certainly any solid state material. Um, and so as a, in a chain of about 10 years of partial successes, some failures and, and so forth, I finally landed in 1982 on, on uh, Thai Sapphire and succeeded in demonstrating laser operation, getting a, a, an old crystal that had been kicking around on the campus at MIT from our ceramicist. Developed that and announced that at the Quantum Electronics Conference in Munich in 1982 and subsequently worked on developing that. Um, I left Lincoln Laboratory in 85, as I mentioned, to start the company, and, and my group continued to work on titanium sapphire laser development. In the meantime, uh, the material got to the point where it became a commercial uh, quantity. It, was, it, it essentially stepped in and replaced the, uh, the dye laser, which had been the mainstay of the scientific tunable laser community. And that started about 1988 and 89, and that became very rapidly accepted. We, our, my company made some products, Spectrophysics, Coherent did, and other companies, and sold a lot of systems. They were initially used um, as CW sources to, um, to test things like Erbian fiber amplifiers as well as do basic science. Uh, subsequent to that, in experimental work on Thai Sapphire Laser, a group in Scotland at the University of St. Andrews discovered under certain conditions the laser could be mode locked and surprisingly, uh, using a technique that it was later discovered to be Carolyn's mode locking, generate really short pulses. In fact, pulses that approach the fundamental limit of the material. And over about a 10 year period, that technology was developed to the point where the Thai Sapphire layer was, was generating 10 femtosecond pulses or so, extremely short. And it was a practical source. The, the earlier technology had been liquid dye lasers, it was very hard to use. The Thai Sapphire enabled uh, relatively easily you know, fabricated and operated ultrafast lasers and made them available to a wide variety of users in the biological and chemical areas. Um, subsequently, uh, many people used those short pulses to characterize and freeze uh, very fast events like molecular dynamics. Uh, and one of the Nobel Prizes in physics, uh, I might say, well, was really uh, given 
for his, the work that he did using ultra-fast lasers, and anti-sapphire in particular, I think, to, to understand how molecules move and how they interact. Um, a side effort uh, that later became a major effort in that evolution of the Thai Sapphire technology was um, at the same time that the Thai Sapphire uh, was, was being developed to generate short pulses, Gerard Maru um, and his co-workers at Rochester came up with the chirp pulse amplification technology which allowed you to take a very short pulses and amplify them to very high energies. The problem with that in principle was if you took the short pulse as it came out of the laser and amplified it up, the pulse itself would have so much peak power that it would eventually damage all the optics in the system. And what Gerard uh, and Donna Strickland was his coworker pointed out is if you take the pulse and stretch it out by using uh, the spectral properties of the material from tens to hundreds of femtoseconds to nearly a nanosecond, now you can propagate that pulse through a high amplifier, high energy amplifier chain and go to very high energies and that chirp pulse amplification technique combined with the Thai sapphire material became the basis for making lasers that could generate terawatts and then petawatts and then exawatts of peak power in a very small and compact system. And so that whole area has developed into a major physics development and those high peak power pulses are used to again study some very fundamental physics as well as generate extremely high harmonics up into the ultraviolet. The holy grail being the development of x-ray sources that can be used for biological and eventually hopefully uh, practical applications in x-ray analysis much better than an x-ray source. So the Thai Sapphire laser is, has been a great success. I hadn't really thought it was going to be that way. We were doing it for other reasons, but um, it's become a very substantial success uh, from a scientific standpoint and Nobel Prizes and being able to do great physics. Um, from a commercial standpoint, my understanding is uh, it's sustained the scientific laser industry for a number of years. I think the last time I checked, the accumulated product sales for the Thai Sapphire laser are around $0.6 billion. So it's had a substantial economic impact as well. Um, MIT didn't think it was worth patenting when I, when I went to them. They had run out of funds and just didn't, weren't interested. So uh, I never benefited from that, sadly. But uh, in some sense, the fact that the laser was made free to the community probably helped it rather than saying if it had been licensed to one company, it may not have developed the way it did. It was broadly developed by a lot of companies competing and that helped build the technology. So it was good for the community.